Okay, so anyway, let, let me just say a few things about this whole practice, and, th- and then we'll do Q&A, and I'm really looking forward to finding out what, uh, what you know or what you want to know. Um, first of all, how I got into this, um, I have the same training as most of you, you know, th- three degrees in piano performance, built around repertoire. And uh, I love that, I value that, and I-, I think doing this is not really possible without the technical training and the repertoire. Uh, it, it really can't exist on its own because where do you get this sound and the, you know this style and these ideas and all these references? You, you have to have that training. So you can't just skip the, um, the foundational stuff. I do occasionally get questions, you know, I want to go to music school, but I don't want to play Czerny and Bach and the Well-Tempered Clavier. I want to go straight to improv. And I always say, you, I don't think you can do that. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so I had that and, and was just happily doing all of that stuff and always was fascinated with pianists like Keith Jarrett, Brad Meldow, um, always have loved jazz and at one point started studying jazz because I wanted to add it to my classical programs. You know, So I might play Chopin Nocturne and some Handel and whatever and then uh, in the second half, you know, kind of have some fun. Oh, sorry. kind of stuff or um, I just love that music it's so beautiful and in the process of learning about jazz a, a lot of ways in which events in jazz that are made up I could see an immediate correspondent with events in classical music that are written down and thought well why can't it be made up in classical music for example one of the first things one notices is variation form, so chacons, passacalias, and any kind of variation form is just riffing on a chord progression. Okay? For for the most part. Obviously, you get into later Schumann, Beethoven, they they change the rules, but for example, Handel. Uh, Most of the variation sets of Handel are, are fairly strictly following a set of changes. Well, that's jazz. Memorize this, you know, these 32 bars of changes and then riff on it. And I thought, well, Handel, HWV 442, is 62 riffs on a little eight bar chord progression. I thought, well, why couldn't I make that up? Why does it have to be from a score? Couldn't I make it up? That, this just seems cool. So I would sneak this stuff into concerts. Like I would play Handel, or, or um, you guys probably know. Uh, that little Rameau thing. Uh, I would sneak improvised variations in and not tell the audience that I was doing it just to see if I could make it match. You know, if, if, I don't know, what's going to happen? Is my hair going to catch on fire? Are the cops coming through the back door? You know, just we'd never done this before and it's such a violation of the rules. I just wanted to see what would happen and nothing happened. Everyone was like, oh, such good classical playing of the written score. Like, he totally fooled you. Okay, so, okay, next step, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do this and um, play a game with the audience. C- can you guess who's me and who's Handel? Okay, so that went fine. And then maybe two or three or four variations. And then, okay, the whole thing. We're going to do the whole thing. And so that's kind of how I eased into it on, on the stage. Meanwhile... I'm thinking about, okay, what if you don't have a chord progression to lean on? Uh, because that's your life raft, right? Is this, this thing that's going to loop, and you always know where you are, so you, all you have to do is decorate it. Well, that's a very nice security blanket. What if you don't have that? What if you just have to make the whole thing up? What do you do? Uh, and that's where I kind of stumbled into Partimento studies, which is, the many of you know, the Italian musicianship system where you learn a harmonic language that arises from the bass line. And the basic problem, if I selected one of you at random, let's say someone who's not had any background improvising, and I said, just come up here, sit at the piano, we're all watching you expectantly, improvise something. What would be the thought that would go through your head? What, what problem do you immediately encounter when, if someone did that to you? What do you think? 
Exactly. Okay? We all sort of know harmony as auditors. If I sit in a class with a piece of paper, I can give it some Roman numerals. Okay? And I sometimes say snarky things about Roman numerals. I do. They, they are useful. They are a form of understanding. But they are not the form of understanding that you need in real-time creation. Preach. Okay, all right. We got, we got the congregation going now. What they're for is for backing away from real music and analyzing it on paper to talk about certain vertical aspects of it. But they are of no use whatsoever when you're actually playing. You can't think in Roman numerals. They aren't fast enough. I compare this with, um, if I'm flying a plane, and I have all these instruments giving me information, and uh, there's a little thing here giving me a stock market ticker. You know, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson stock is up so much, and Dow Corning and, and Amazon. That's true information, but not only do I not need that, it's in the way. If, it's, if I'm paying attention to it, it's actually distracting me, okay? So there's such a thing as true information that is unhelpful. And the Roman numeral system is true information that is unhelpful when you're trying to improvise. And that's why nobody has ever improvised from a Roman numeral system. It simply has not happened. Where do the great improvisers come from? Continuo and chord symbols in jazz. That's it. That's it. Okay, because those give you the useful information. So, anyway, um, what Partimento does, and I'll explain this later in the class in more detail, is it starts from the bass. And every possible thing that can happen in the bass, every motion of the bass, step, leap, up, down, stay put, has a range of upper voice harmonic solutions. Sometimes one thing, sometimes ten things. And when you know what all of those are, and what every possible bass motion is, you now have the complete harmonic vocabulary of the 18th century. We're not, we're not done with counterpoint yet. That's another level. But at least harmony, I always have something I know how to do. So if I see a bass that goes... Well, at least from class, I know it's not going to do this. Right? I know that. I know that much. I learned about parallel. But from Partimento, I learned there, there are various... Also, some very important rhythmic cues. Um, the syncopated bass that is either tied, restruck, or um, you know, just played continuously, but it changes in a syncopated manner. So it's changing, let's say we're in 4-4, four, four. it's changing on 2 and 4. So 1, 2, uh, one, two 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So normally we see that with ties. Okay? It's a very specific assignment in part of it. It's this. Or I could do... Okay, this is known as a tied bass motion. So really, everything that can happen in the bass has an answer in the upper voices. Usually the upper voices, it's two basic voices and then some other optional ones. And brilliantly, the two upper voices are invertible almost all the time. It doesn't matter which one you put in the soprano. So you always have a contrapuntal variation, no matter what you're doing, available to you. I'll give you one example, one of my favorite examples. This bass motion is rising fifths. Now, of course, we don't actually play them like that. We go, we do that. Uh, and what happens on rising fifths is, and then from here, I could go a variety of places. Now, I started here. Let me invert those voices. Okay. 
So I could do them twice in a row, like a little variation. Um, change them immediately, I always have at least two versions of everything ready to go. And of course, repetition and variation is one of the foundational ideas of music. So that's just a short version of why uh, the bass motion system is so powerful and does provide that complete available harmonic vocabulary. They taught modulation, um, they taught um, figuration, they teach diminution, everything comes with it. So that's really where it comes from. Um, maybe one more example of the invertibility. Um, oh, like uh, this is from um, from uh, Rameau. Rameau loves to use this. This is going to be up a fifth, up a step. So here are my voices. I go up the fifth and I take a suspension. And then I go up a step in the bass and I take another suspension. Okay, and I started here, but I can start here. Okay, and in this case, the upper voices are doing seven, six dissonance, consonance pairs, and then you convert that to two threes. Everything has something else you can then do with it, so, which is why it's so open-ended and so friendly for improvisation, because the fundamental improvisation is, uh-oh, what now? Right? So, uh-oh, what now? <laughs> if, if I don't know the wonder band, I say, okay, C major, fine. What, what comes nice after C major? Well, if I grew up on rock and roll, That's the vocabulary of rock and roll. Um, and if you get young people who have fiddled around with improvisation on their own, what they're going to tend to do is jump around a bunch of root position harmonies, which is the antithesis of what classical music wants to do. So that's why Partimento is so helpful. 